Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very, very senior professor from the world of academia, Professor Dr. Paul J. Duplexi from Edinburgh, UK. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Professor du, uh, J. Duplexi is uh, the professor of Roman Law School of Law, the University of Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, before we start talking about Roman law, and I must start by saying I know very little about Roman law, tell me about your own journey. Um, well, my journey is a bit of an, uh, uh, a roundabout one, let's put it that way. Um, so currently, I'm professor of Roman law at the University of Edinburgh in the School of Law. Um, I've held this chair since 2017. Um, and uh, my field of interest and also my field of um, of, of teaching and, and research is Roman law. Mm. Now, um, Edinburgh and Edinburgh Law School specifically is internationally known for the study of Roman law. Um, there's a long intellectual tradition that goes back until the 18th century for the study of Roman law here mm -hmm. that's bound up with the Scottish Enlightenment, um, which we can talk about a bit later. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been a number of very successful scholars here that my readership uh, and the listeners may have heard about, you know, such as Peter Burks, who was later professor at Oxford, mm -hmm. and Alan Watson, uh, a very well-known Roman lawyer, was mm -hmm. uh, latterly professor at Athens, mm -hmm. Georgia. And then also back into the 19th century, for example, uh, uh, James Muirhead, uh, Henry Gowley, who again was professor at Oxford subsequently. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've worked for the University of Edinburgh School of Law for a long time now. Mm -hmm. I think it's coming up to 21 years. Wow. Um, I've been here since uh, early 2000s. And, um, I started fresh out of graduate program when I finished my PhD mm -hmm. uh, in Rotterdam, and so I've been here ever since. Amazing. So that that's that's my that's my journey. Fascinating. And for mm -hmm. our viewers and listeners, can you give me a brief overview of Roman law and its significance in the modern world? <laughs> well. Um, it, that is a complicated issue and one which can probably fill an entire podcast on its own. So okay. permit me to say this. Um, uh, in uh, the European context, there is a, uh, it is generally accepted in comparative law, traditional comparative law systems, that there is a, a group or a family of, of legal systems known as civilian legal systems. And the civilian legal systems are ones which have their intellectual basis in Roman law. Mm -hmm. Now, why would uh, a bunch of European legal systems uh, ultimately create rules of law based on Roman law? The answer is partly something to do with the historical and intellectual um, tradition of the Roman Empire, but more so to do with the subsequent um, intellectual uh, traditions of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and to just put it broadly, um, what we know about Roman law miraculously survived antiquity. Mm -hmm. um, and came to be rediscovered in the late medieval period in the, the 12th century. Mm -hmm. And this was around the time that European universities in the form that we understand them now were created. And um, at these universities, people studied traditionally two subjects, uh, theology on the one hand and law on the other mm -hmm. hand. And um, with the rediscovery of Roman law, the teachers from the Middle Ages onwards uh, found Roman law to be a useful teaching tool. And so it became a kind of bedrock for European legal teaching, uh, the teaching of law and also the development of law in Europe. And so it happened that, um, you know, when national legal systems started to be created in the early modern period, the 16th and 17th century in Europe and elsewhere, um, Roman law provided a ready stock of rules and principles and terminology and so on. And all of this could then be utilized to create the legal systems, mm. um, um, you know, uh, in the way that we understand. That's them now. That's now, you may ask, why Scotland? Well, mm. um, Scotland has a unique relationship to the rest of the United Kingdom in the sense mm. that legally it's, it's, it's a separate jurisdiction mm. for international private law purposes. And the reason for that is, of course, because the United Kingdom, as it now um, 
exists is a fairly recent creation. It's a mm -hmm. creation from 1707 onwards. And before that time, Scotland and England were separate countries. Mm -hmm. And the Scottish legal tradition was much more based on the European legal tradition um, and European conceptions of law than the English common law, mm -hmm. which is effectively the law of England. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So what I'm hearing you really say is that Roman law has had its own set of influences on European law. Uh, mm -hmm. But what about British law? Well, now that's that's a very interesting that's a very interesting thing. First of all, um, so in the United Kingdom, we um, we have a number of different legal systems. Yep. So there's Scots law, um, which is the law of Scotland, and which is heavily influenced by um, the civilian tradition, also by English law to some extent. Mm -hmm. Um, the influence of Roman law and English law is, is a whole separate field of study mm -hmm. on which you might want to get a, a guest who is an, a trained common lawyer to tell mm -hmm. you more about that. Mm -hmm. But in, in brief terms, even in its earliest phases of development, English common law was also influenced by Roman law through the connection of the church in the Middle Ages and so mm -hmm. on. So it's not as if English common law is developed completely isolated from the study of Roman law. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it ha there have been historical influences, and there continue to be influences mm -hmm. in modernity. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, how independent was the judiciary in Roman times? I mean, again, I know very <laughs> little, but you know, when you had these powerful emperors, how how independent was the judiciary? That's a complex question, uh, and perhaps one. Um, which can only be touched upon briefly. So I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to give a kind of overview. Yeah. So um, in order to understand uh, th this question, I think we need to talk about technicalities a little bit. So first of all, um, it's important to appreciate that the Roman legal system was a system of remedies rather than a system of abstract legal rights. Mm -hmm. um, so abstract legal rights form part of the discussion of, by the Roman jurists and so on. But by and large, the Roman legal order functioned on um, specific remedies for specific transgressions or for specific contractual breaches and things of that kind. Mm -hmm. So in other words, to say that one had a legal right to, say, a piece of property or so, uh, like ownership, the Romans would not necessarily discuss the whole issue of ownership in an abstract way. They would always discuss it with reference to the legal remedy that one needed to use in order to enforce or counteract certain claims in a court of law. So that means necessarily that um, procedure, legal procedure, is very important for understanding Roman law. Right. Um, even you know, if one might think that legal procedure is a rather dry thing and a rather dry topic, it is in fact vitally important in order to understand the law, even so also in modernity. And so legal procedure is quite important for understanding Roman law. Now, with that said, um, uh, what we know about the Roman legal system and specifically about the procedures that operated in the civil courts of, of, of the Romans is actually quite a lot because of the way in which our information has been passed down to us. And in the period that most people study um, when they talk about Roman law, they look at the, the sort of last two centuries BC and the first three centuries AD, mm -hmm. which is when Roman law is at its most complicated intellectually um, at its high point. And there the system of procedure is known as the formulary procedure mm. because um, it had a kind of, um, um, well, to give an example, it, 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 had, um, um, it, ha it had a sort of documentary basis, let's put it that way. And I'll explain a little bit what I mean by um, a documentary basis in a bit. But the most important thing to realize is much like in modern law, still in Roman law, uh, litigation was at the one end of a spectrum of ways in which one could resolve a dispute between parties. Yeah. Um, the Romans had, on the more informal side of it, they also had things that we would now call mediation, which was, of course, not legally binding, arbitration, which could be legally binding, depending on how the parties had entered into it. And then if nothing else worked, then you had litigation, much like in a modern, modern legal system. Mm -hmm. And, of course, litigation... Is a, is a last resort, and it's also a bit dangerous because you never know what kind of answer you're going to get, and the answer is quite often not what you want it to be. Mm. And so now to circle back to your question of how independent judges were 
in this civil procedure um, mm. system of the formula, which we know quite a bit about, um, the procedure was divided into two separate sections. Mm -hmm. The first section was the technically legal part, where the parties were assisted by an official of the Roman state who was in charge of um, uh, Roman court processes. Mm -hmm. And they would first determine what the basis of the lawsuit was, what the remedy was that they were going to use. They would assist the parties in drafting what is known as a formula, which is basically like a mm -hmm. writ, um, and put all of the information in there. Then the lawsuit passed over to the second stage of the lawsuit, and this is where the judge comes in. Now, the interesting thing about judges in Roman law, mm -hmm. and first of all, I should say the interesting thing about courts in Roman law is that courts were in the formulary system, not necessarily held in a purpose-built building. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were very public. They were held in large sort of open halls mm -hmm. that we find in um, in and around forums, you know, in any Roman, right. uh, Roman city. And so if you were to enter litigation, you had to be prepared to wash your dirty laundry in public, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know, because everybody could stand around and hear yeah. what, what's up. Mm -hmm. So already one has to think a bit carefully about whether litigation is the strategy for you. Mm -hmm. um, but if you decided um, that litigation was the strategy for you, at the end of the first stage where you have a, um, um, the parties have agreed on this writ, the judge, um, the, the this of, officer in charge of the first uh, series or the first stage of the lawsuit would then ask the parties to choose a judge. Now, um, there were ways in which one could choose a judge. Mm -hmm. at, the, uh, at the start of each year, um, a list of names were made. Mm -hmm. And these were just general individuals. They were not trained in law. Um, they were just people who had free time and who wanted to sit as a judge. Mm -hmm. Now, there were certain requirements of wealth and status and so on, but the parties could circumvent that if they mm -hmm. wanted to. And if they found a third party who was willing to act as a judge for them, who didn't fulfill those status requirements, mm -hmm. then they could select that person. But if they couldn't agree on a person, then um, a person was appointed to them from these lists. Um, and then once the once the matter came before the judge, mm -hmm. the judge had to had a very limited role really mm -hmm. in in the Roman legal process. What they what they were asked to do is mm -hmm. based on the writ which had already been set up. Um, they would just have to decide based on the evidence provided to them mm -hmm. whether they were going to condemn or acquit. So it was kind mm -hmm. of binary. And once they had made that decision, they were released from the judgment. Um, so that they didn't have to do anything. And mm -hmm. interestingly, what was expected of them was to listen to the available evidence, mm -hmm. take their own experiences into account, and then based on this idea of the reasonable person, the average reasonable person, they would find in favor of one party or another. Yes. Amazing. Now, how independent were they? Mm -hmm. Well, they were independent in the sense that they were not government employees. Mm -hmm. um, they were paid for this. They did this as a civic duty. They were independent in the sense that um, the parties could choose who they want to be the judge. That means that you could get over certain biases of wealth and status and things mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. kind. Mm -hmm. And... Um, well, they were also independent, strangely enough, because, and we, we don't know a lot about this, but there seems to have been a remedy, so a legal remedy available, um, uh, where a party who felt that the judge had somehow manipulated the process in order to favor the other party mm. and were therefore un, um, un, you know, dissatisfied with the outcome, could sue the judge to the value of the lawsuit that so there there were remedies available but mm. maybe not judicial review or anything in the way that yeah. we understand it today um but they were not you know they were not without remedies. Oh, fascinating available. thank you what a great response and thank you i've learned something new from you today my next question is that how did roman law or how does Roman law contribute to our understanding of other aspects of ancient Roman civilization, such as its society, its economy, or politics? Well, again, that, that's, a, that's an answer that one can um, give a short or a very long answer to. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, 
let, let me see, let me, let me try and answer that as best as I can. Mm. So when, when we look at a modern legal system, mm. uh, whether we've studied law or we haven't studied law and we're just looking at it dispassionately as an interested third party, mm. there is sometimes this idea which floats around in the papers and so on that law is a mirror of society. Mm. It's not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's not, and it never will be, mm -hmm. um, because law is a kind of subsystem, a social subsystem that functions independently from other social subsystems like economics and politics within mm -hmm. society. And the responses of the law to societal problems are often convoluted um, and also um, uh, indirect, and also take a bit of time in order mm. to crystallize. Mm. So one shouldn't necessarily think that law is a mirror of society. And mm. if one looks at law, um, especially past law, in order to see what a society thought or what a society did, mm. one must one must be prepared to accept that the answer that you will get is a is a very partial one and one right. that cannot really explain everything. Mm. Um, so. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that law is completely insulated from society mm, or from economics or politics, but it's a bit more complicated to find those responses and to identify them. Now, many people who are very much more clever than I have have written about finding these responses. And one mm. of these that I really like is the German social legal scholar Niklas Luhmann. Mm -hmm. And Luhmann's theory was that... Um, all of these different social subsystems like politics, economics, and law, and so on, they coexist within a society. And sometimes they correspond with one another. So in other words, they talk to one another. Mm -hmm. But they can only talk to one another if there are issues which overlap in, in you know, issues which transcend one subsystem and go into another subsystem. Mm -hmm. And it's those points of overlap and contact which provides the opportunity for interdisciplinary discussion. Mm -hmm. So to give you one example, um, contractual risk mm -hmm. is one, mm -hmm. right? So contractual risk is a legal issue, yeah. but it's also an economic issue. It can also be, for example, an ecological issue. You know, right. So it's those overlaps between different subsystems that allows mm -hmm. us to, mm -hmm. to look at intersectional points of um, society, economics, politics, mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. of that kind. Fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned to me a few minutes back that if the people are not happy with the judgment, they could sue the judge. Mm -hmm. Do you think Roman law has had an influence on the development of human rights? Very much so. Very much so. Um, we tend to think of human rights as a kind of modern um, invention. And by mm -hmm. modern invention, I, I mean uh, a concept of modernity, right? A concept of modernity, but it's not... It's, it's very important to, to appreciate that in certainly um, in, the, in the way in which human rights discussions started in the European legal tradition was in the aftermath of the French Revolution of 1789. Mm -hmm. And um, if one reads the discussions um, contained in the literature of that period, for example, Rousseau, um, and a little bit earlier Montesquieu and all of these kinds of things, you see that there are debates about the nature of man and about the true state of man being free or not free and so on, and whether there are inalienable rights that mm. anyone has, is very much coaxed in the language of Roman law because yeah. of the fact that Roman law was such a um, pervasive influence in European mm. legal education in the 18th mm. century. And also, of course, it spills over into discussions of natural law, mm. you know, and um, the rights of man. So, yes, I, I think it has had an influence, certainly um, historically uh, and in the way in which um, the terminology of Roman law was co-opted into this discussion mm. about, about mm. freedom and equality and so on. Mm. Fascinating. So, uh, Paul, I have time for two more questions. Yeah. Uh, my next one is uh, that based on all the study and all the work that you've done, can you think of an interesting legal case from Roman history that stands out that you know uh, 
you might want to share with uh, our audience? Well, um, let me give you a bit of the historical <laughs> information. Okay. Yeah. When, um, when I was a student um, in secondary school, uh, I could not quite make up my mind whether I wanted to study law or whether I wanted to study history. And I ended up com combining the study of the mm. two at university. But one of the reasons I became absolutely fascinated by the study of law was because as a student, I started reading Cicero. Um, now, Cicero was a famous courtroom orator yeah. um, who lived in the, the sort of end of the Roman Republic. And he's internationally well known for his courtroom oratory, but also for his other speeches. And so and I became absolutely enthralled by these speeches of his, because it was the first time one could read really how courtroom, courtroom orators were taking the law and um, using public speaking in order to convince a judge um, of the truth and accuracy of their case. Mm -hmm. So I've always been a Cicero fan. And for example, if I were to ask you what is my most interesting thing in Roman legal history that I like, you know, I would have to mention a few of Roman of the cases that Cicero engages with in a mm -hmm. court of law. For example, mm -hmm. my ultimate favorite one, and it's also one that um, you know, if you search around on the internet, you can probably find because there was a BBC mm -hmm. in our time a reenactment made of this thing. Okay, and it's Cicero's defense of Sextus Roscius in eighteen eighty BC. Mm -hmm. um the the oops um, one of my things mm -hmm. fell out um so the the case is a bit complicated but it boils down to this um cicero defended a man called sextus roscius who was mm -hmm. accused of killing his father mm -hmm. now in a patriarchal society such as the romans this was a terrible terrible right. thing to do mm -hmm. um, batricide is 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 one of the most you know um, grave crimes that one could engage mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. and um so when when Sextus Roscius approached him and said, you know, uh, I want you to um, defend me, there were lots of people who said, don't do this, because there's there are larger political issues here that you don't want to get involved in. Mm. Um, and what had happened was um, the father of Sextus Roscius had been proscribed, so he'd been put on the list of enemies of the state mm. um, by a powerful politician and his um, lover, so that they could then um, acquire the property of Sextus Roscius. Mm -hmm. And they had to get the son out of the way at the same time. And mm -hmm. so they um, basically uh, accused the son of having killed the father. Okay. Um, and so they could get the, the son out of the way as well. And so what happens in this case is that um, Cicero, very sorry, I just need to mm -hmm. put down the cat. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, Cicero very cleverly shows that there is no evidence that Sextus Roski has killed his father, but rather that this is all a political plot to get the property of the father mm -hmm. of Sextus Roski by these powerful politicians. Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's beautifully, beautifully argued, and it's a real sort of cliffhanger up till the last sentence about. Um, and he he offers these kind of immortal lines that you know that's resonated through the ages. Qui mm. bono? Mm. Who was the true beneficiary mm. of the killing of Sextus Roscius's father? Who Amazing. benefited? And the person who benefited was, of course, not Sextus Roscius, but these politicians. Wow. So yeah, I I would have to say that's wow. that's what I'm I must about. I must go and search for this uh, case and also read a little more about Cicero. And my last question to you, mm. uh, and this is for the many, many people who will listen to our conversation. How do you think the study of Roman law can benefit society as a whole? Well, to me, um, uh, the study of Roman law is 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 a is a public good. It's a it's a universal public good. You mm. know, in, in a way that, for example, Greek philosophy is, mm. or the study of literature. Um, I think it's very important because we see the whole range of human experience mm -hmm. in the Roman legal export in, in the Roman legal sources, you know, from and some of those disputes seem so achingly familiar to us. Um squabbling neighbors, uh complaints over ownership, you know, breach of boundary stones, all of these things that we see mm -hmm. today still. And I think if 
if you if, if you study the sum total of human experience distilled through a legal system such as that of the Romans, mm. it gives you a kind of wonderful appreciation of how so much of what you think of as modern is in mm. fact not modern at all, but mm. it's just the latest incremental part of a conversation which had mm. started millennia ago and which is still continuing and will continue past us as well. Mm. And so to me, that's the ultimate, um, you know, that's the ultimate reason why Amazing. I think Roman law is so important. Amazing. Amazing. And on that note, Paul, I just want to say thank you so much for speaking to me about Roman law. When I read about you, I was so fascinated with the whole subject. I said, I must reach out to you to speak to you. Thank you for agreeing to speak to me. Thank you for sharing so many new things for me, from my perspective, and I'm sure for a lot of our viewers and listeners as well, about how Roman law seems to have shaped modern day legal systems, seem to have influenced society, seem to have influenced so much more than we had ever imagined uh, that the Romans have given to uh, Europe, UK, and the rest of the world, of course. Thank you again and good luck to you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.